Matthew 24, verse 32. Now the Bible says, Now learn a parable of the fig tree. When his branch is yet tender and putteth forth leaves, ye know that summer is nigh. So likewise ye, when ye shall see all these things, know that it is near even at the doors. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until that day that Noah entered into the ark. And knew not until the flood came and took them all away, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Then shall two be in the field, the one shall be taken and the other left. Two women shall be grinding at the mill, the one shall be taken and the other left. Watch therefore, for ye know not what hour your Lord doth come. But, now, but know this, that if the goodman of the house had known in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken up. Therefore be ye also ready, for in such an hour as ye think not, the Son of Man cometh. You know, uh, it's a good thing to be able to walk into church on a Sunday morning and have three lessons that you think would go very well for the morning Sunday school class. Most people would say, well, Brother Steve, you've been studying hard and, you know, three lessons, that's pretty good. And it's not good. It's not good at all. Because what you do is you wallow around and you're miserable because you feel like you don't have the mind of the Lord because you don't have the one lesson for Sunday school. You have three. I'm glad that we have a pastor that minds the Lord and he kind of shook me up this morning and so he put me in the right direction. But anyway, you know, there's a lot of things this morning that we could be learning about. You know, I would love to be able to talk about heaven for a little while. As far as I know, uh, in this Sunday school class, we've never had anything in depth at all on heaven. And believe me, there's a lot to talk about when it comes to heaven. I don't know about you, I would enjoy talking about heaven. I would enjoy, you know, getting excited about the streets of gold and the pearly gates and so on and so forth. But uh, the Lord has not uh, ever allowed us to do that. And there's some other things, you know, that we should try to, to work out. And, you know, it's good when you can get together as, uh, you know, uh, children of God and, and students of the Bible and you can glean from the... Uh, uh, New Testament epistles, how the, the Lord intended for us to live our Christian lives. I think that that's beneficial. We certainly have done a lot of that in this Sunday school class, trying to determine how it is that the Lord would have us to conduct ourselves and what we need to be careful about and all of those kind of things. But if we're not careful as Christians, we will get so caught up in being a Christian that we will forget about some of the, the, the most important things. You know, we'll get uh, talking about heaven and we'll get talking about different things and if we're not careful, we'll forget about why it is that we do what we do. In this particular passage of scriptures, there's certainly some things that we should be able to rejoice about. We should be able to rejoice in the fact that one of these days the Lord Jesus Christ is going to come back and He's going to receive us into Himself. Isn't that what He said? He said, in my Father's house are many mansions. He said, if it were not so, I would have told you. He said, I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go to prepare a place for you, I will return again uh, and receive you unto myself, so that where I am, huh? Isn't that good? Yeah. Going to be with him one day. We should be able to get excited about that, right? Yes, Amen. Temper that for just a moment, because when that day happens, there are going to be people that are not going to be ready. Are you with me? I'm glad that you're ready. I'm glad that I'm ready. But there are some folks that are not going to be ready. And if we're not careful, we will get so caught up in being Christians that we, for, we will forget the important thing that we are to do, and that is to go out and tell a lost and dying world about Jesus Christ and what He did for you and what He did for me and what He'll do for them as, as well. You know, I read down here and I, I read about these, uh, these folks down towards the end of the chapter where it said that there would be, uh, you know, two... 
And uh, two would be in a field and one would be taken and the other left. And uh, two women would be grinding at the mill and the one shall be taken and the other left. And while on one hand we are certainly tickled to death that there are uh, some of those that are, are taken that whenever the Lord comes back they're going to be called up into the air and so on and so forth if you're thinking along the lines of the rapture. But you know uh, I still think every once in a while about those that are going to be left behind. You know, people often wonder how can that many people be taken out and, and still be able to explain it in such a way that people will not give honor and glory unto God. But you know, the Bible does say that we'll believe a lie. And we also know that honestly, if you start looking this thing out, there's not as many people going as you think are going. There's a lot of people that think they're going and they're not going. Are you with me? There's a lot of people who think they're ready for that day, but they are not ready for that day. And I'll be honest with you, around the workplace, it wouldn't be surprising to see some leave and some stay, would it? But what about in a church? You would think that if the rapture had happened while we were in the church, you would think that we would be sitting here with an empty church with empty pews. But I'm here to caution you that that's not the case. A lot of churches around, they would still just be as full as they are before the rapture. Are you with me? Because they're full of people going through the motions. They're full of people who name the name of Christ, but they don't know Jesus Christ. Uh, they're doing all kinds of good worldly deeds and giving to charity and all that kind of stuff. But whenever they stand before the Lord, the Lord is going to say, Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. Are you with me? So this morning, I'd like to get excited about some of those things, but what we're going to concentrate on is we're going to concentrate on those that are going to be left behind. How should we deal with them? What should we tell them? How should we get them on board with us? Because I'll be honest with you, I don't want someone to show up for church tonight if the rapture happens this afternoon. Are you with me? Think about it now. What did I say? If the rapture happens tonight... I don't want someone to come pulling on the front doors wondering why they're locked. That means they've been left behind. That means they're not ready. That means that somewhere down the road they were deceived. Are you with me? Listen, one thing I want is I want us in heaven as Emmanuel Baptist Church rejoicing around the throne of God together. Are you with me? I want to serve with you here on the earth and I want to rejoice with you in heaven. But friends, we have to unforget some of the things that we have already forgotten. And I think a good place to start is uh, right in line with this scripture. There are four places in this scripture where I see that there is a surprise that takes place. In verse number 36, it says, But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. And I realize that there's a lot of people that say that they know when the rapture is going to happen. They know when the world's going to come to an end. They write books. They go on Letterman. They do all these interviews. And then guess what? Whenever we're still here, January 2013, they're running back and refiguring their calculations and everything else, wondering how in the world could they have been wrong. Well, they're wrong because they never knew. The Lord doesn't reveal that to anybody. Are you with me? Only the Father knows that. But it's going to be a surprise when the Lord returns. When that trumpet sounds, it's going to come as a surprise. Uh, we're not necessarily going to be standing around waiting for it. You know, when Jesus was born in Bethlehem, they knew He was going to be born in Bethlehem, Brother Lamont. They knew it was prophesied that that's where He was going to be born. I'll be honest with you, if I was an innkeeper in Bethlehem, I think I would have had one room uh, that I always kept aside just in case that was the day or that was the time that Jesus needed a place to be born. But no, it wasn't that way. Why? They weren't paying attention. They weren't watching. They weren't looking. And in this day and age, we're not looking for the return of Jesus Christ. When Brother Doug mentions that we're going to have a meeting at such and such a time on Sunday evening, everybody just says, okay, well, I'll be there. You may or may not be here. Are you with me? And Christians never think about the fact that today could be the day that the rapture transpires. Today could be the day that we're called up in the air. Today could be the day that the Lord returns uh, and we leave this world. Are you with me? And if we leave, guess what? Our work is finished. You better have done what it is that you want to do. 
your work is finished. If there's somebody that you wanted to witness to, you better have witnessed to them already. If there's somebody that you wanted to invite to church, you better have invited them to church already because that would be the day that your work is finished because you'll be with Him. There'll be no more knocking on doors. There'll be no more wooing people to the Lord Jesus Christ. You'll either be there or you won't be there. Are you with me? Also look in verse number 42. Watch therefore, for you know not what hour your Lord doth come. Now first it says nobody knows other than the Father. Now it says ye know not what hour your Lord doth come. Now let's just forget about the fact that Brother Steve doesn't know for just a moment. Let's forget about the fact that Brother Doug doesn't know, that the world don't know, the Pope don't know, nobody knows, you don't know. Are you with me? You don't have a clue what hour the Lord is going to return. And until then, you better be busy about the Lord's business or you're going to be found like that little fellow with his hand in the cookie jar. You're going to be found doing not what you're supposed to be doing, but something that you're not supposed to be doing. You better get serious about this thing. And just like Brother Doug said before, this is a serious business. It's more serious than just somebody's hurt feelings or what have you. This is a matter of life and death. And when we come into the house of God, we need to understand that. But when we go out into the world, we need to have that knowledge so that we can win souls to the Lord Jesus Christ. Look down in verse number 44. In verse 44 it says, Therefore be ye also ready, for in such an hour as ye think not, the Son of Man cometh. And believe me, I know that there are times that you get wrapped up in your world and you think, well, the Lord's going to come back, but He ain't going to come back right now. You do not know. And I'll be honest with you, odds are He's going to come back when we are least ready for Him. When we least expect it, we just to be looking for Him because that's when He's going to return. But so far we see that these are all surprises. The Lord is going to show up when somebody doesn't know about it or when they're not ready for it or when they least expect it. But also look in verse number 50. In verse number 50 it says, The Lord of that servant shall come in a day when he looketh not for him and in an hour that he is not aware of. So we realize that this whole thing is going to be a surprise. The Bible says that he cometh as a thief in the night. Are you with me? A thief in the night. We don't know when it's going to happen. We're not going to be ready, but it's going to happen and it's going to be a surprise and it's going to be a wonderful surprise for some of us. If you know the Lord Jesus Christ, it's going to be a wonderful surprise if you're sitting at the kitchen table wondering how you're going to pay the bills this month and lo and behold, the Lord comes and raptures you out and you say, who cares, devil, you pay the bills. Are you with me? That's going to be a wonderful surprise. But it's going to be a not so wonderful surprise too, Brother Ray, because there's going to be a lot of folks who are planning on tomorrow to get right with the Lord. Or for tomorrow to get something done for the Lord. They've been procrastinating. They've been putting off. They've been rejecting. And they're counting on tomorrow. But what does the Bible say? The Bible says that our life is as a vapor. It appeareth for a little while and then vanisheth away. There are people in this very room that are missing. Why? Because they went home to be with the Lord. You can go back a year or two years or three years or whatever and they were here worshiping and rejoicing with us but now they're gone home to be with the Lord. They were here but as a vapor, now they're gone. Are you with me? One of these days there may be a service without you or me in it. We don't know what's on tomorrow. But if that's the case and we're going to be surprised pleasantly wouldn't you think that there's going to be a lot of people that would be unpleasantly surprised? And so when I began to think about this, I simply noted some things down that I would be uh, thinking that certainly those people who would get the negative side of the surprise would be surprised about. And so for just a, a few minutes, I'll try to go through these fairly quickly, but some surprises of hell. Because if you haven't come to terms with it, if they don't go to heaven, they're going to hell. Are you with me? If they're not saved, they're lost. If they're saved, they have everlasting life. 
And if they're lost, they have eternal damnation. Are you with me? So if we are rejoicing because we get to go to heaven when this great surprise transpires, there are some that are going to have their fate sealed in that they're going to go to hell and there'll no longer be anything that they can do about that. So there's some surprises of hell. First of all, can I say this? One of the first surprises of hell is the fact that it is real. Are you with me? If you were a normal person who was on your way to hell and you were to close your eyes here and open your eyes there, one of the first surprises would have to be that, hey, this place is real. You say, well, Brother Steve, why is that such a big surprise? The Bible says it's real. Absolutely, the Bible does say it's real. Time and time again. But there are preachers, there are so-called men of God, there are churches that stand on doctrines that say that there is no real physical place called hell, that there is no literal burning fire. It's not a place of torment and agony, but it's just some uh, story made up by the boogeyman to scare you half to death. Friends, I'm going to tell you, there are some folks in hell today that they would tell you it's real. Do you remember Lazarus and the rich man? And do you remember when rich man opened up his eyes, he found that he was in hell and he was in torments and he was in agony. And the first thing that he had to come to torments with is no matter how many times he had tried to discount a place called hell, no many time, how many times he had tried to uh, you know, laugh or mock the scoffers and, 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 and you know, those that came by and said, hey, you better get right with the Lord. Uh, in that moment of time, he had to realize hell is a real place. Listen, there are good Bible preachers that in the past stood on the Word of God and preached the doctrines of the Word of God, but somewhere along the line they've lost their mind and now they say there is no hell. That's exactly right. No hell. Can I tell you what? He'll know beyond a shadow of a doubt one day that there is a hell. I'm not saying that simply because he now says that and he's lost his mind that he was never saved. He could have been saved. That's fine. I'm not one of those people that say that Billy Graham's on his way to hell. He may be though. If all he was doing is going through the motions all those years, he could be the most well-known, televised hell goer ever known to man. Are you with me? Think about it. Hell is real. That's the first thing that people will have to come to terms with after this is they will say, hell is real. The rich man found out it was real, found out that it was hot. Found out that he was in torments there. You're not going to go to hell and party and have a good time with your friends. It's just not going to happen. The second thing that people are going to come into contact with and then realize the surprise of hell is not only that it is real, but they will have to say the words, I am here. Now think about it. Right now, I can think about hell, I can talk about hell, I can preach about hell, I can read my notes and say that the sights of hell is darkness, the smells of hell is burning, the sounds of hell is weeping and gnashing of teeth, the torments of hell is heat and fire, the speech of hell is wailing. I I can say all of those things, I can talk about them and describe them, but I will never experience them. Not because of who I am or what I've done, but because of who He is and what He's done. That's why I'll never have to experience hell. Are you with me? But just because I never experience it doesn't mean I don't have to think about it. And there are going to be somebody that open up their eyes and they're going to be in hell and they're going to see that the place is real and they're going to have to, Brother Ray, utter the words, I can't believe I'm here. I can't believe the preacher was right. I can't believe the Word of God wasn't just kidding me. Are you with me? God does not kid. He has a sense of humor, but He does not kid. He does not pull the wool over your eyes. Uh, He will tell you the truth and expect you to abide in the truth, uh, and that is what He has done. And there's going to have to be some that are surprised that they find themselves in hell. The rich man, I believe, was pretty surprised. 
He was pretty surprised that he was there. But think about what the psalmist wrote in Psalms 55. And I haven't studied it. I don't know exactly what he's talking about here because I know that there is some reality in his day that he was writing about. But when you read this and you listen to this, it kind of gives you an idea of what it would be like to open up your eyes and realize that you went to hell. Think about this. He said, My heart is sore pained within me, and the terrors of death are fallen upon me. Fearfulness and trembling are come upon me and horror hath overwhelmed me. Now I think about the emotion that is going to overwhelm people when they realize that they are in hell. They've heard about it all their life. People have preached that it exists and they ought to do uh, you know, whatever it takes to not go there. They've been told time and time again what they have to do to go to heaven and not go to hell. And they've procrastinated, they've put it off, they've rejected it, they've mocked it, they've made fun of it. But now here they are in hell and all of the horror hits them because everything that they've heard about hell, they suddenly remember it and they realize it's real, Miss Marcy. Can you remember the horror that you had when you found out that you were lost and on your way to hell? Just the idea that if something didn't happen, you could die one day and go to hell was enough to scare you straight, was it not? It was enough to get you motivated to do what thus saith the Lord. Can you imagine knowing you're there and there's nothing that can be done about it? You were deceived. You've got to pay for it the rest of your life. The horror. What a surprise that they have waiting for them. What about this one? There is no escape. There are people today that have found themselves in bad situations and they have made an art form of trying to get out of those bad situations. There are certain people that think that they can explain or sweet talk their way out of anything and everything. But there's no sweet talking. There's no explaining. There's no reasoning Hey, listen, I know there are attorneys out there that believe that they could get anybody off no matter how guilty they seem. Can I tell you what? You will be found guilty. You will be pronounced guilty. You will be cast into the lake of fire and there will be no escape for you ever. The rich man found that out. First, he just wanted to be comforted. Then he started getting the idea that Abraham told him that there was a great gulf that was fixed between where Abraham and Lazarus was and where he was. And that that gulf on that side could not be overcame. On this side of death, it can be overcome. It's overcome by the blood of the Lamb. Are you with me? But on that side of death, there's no way to cross that great gulf. And to realize, here I am, I'm trapped, I can't escape. And can I just say, this is not just a bad dream that you can't get out of. You're not going to pinch yourself and wake up. This is not just something that's a little bit uncomfortable. Are you with me? I've been in some meetings that I wanted to nod off to sleep in, but I persevered and got through it. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about every nerve in your body will be standing at attention, shouting and crying out in agony and in torments. Uh, and I remember one time when I was a young man, I actually splashed 350 degree vegetable oil out of a fryer at a restaurant up onto my face. It ran down my neck. And, and Miss Vicky will tell you, at certain times, if I get the right suntan, you can still see the drips where it ran down my neck. You can still see the scar that it left on my hand and things like that. But I remember the pain that went along with that. I remember for hours after I got home from the doctor, I would put my head underneath the water in the bathtub. I first thought I would get in and turn the shower on. But when the water hit my face, Brother Gary, it hurt too much. So I turned the bath water on, turned it all the way on cold, and stuck my head underneath of that. And as long as I was under that cold water, everything was fine. But do you know what? When I thought everything was okay and I pulled my head out from underneath that bathtub, do you realize that heat returned? That pain returned? And I'm telling you, it seemed like everything in my face was just on fire. I didn't know if I'd get through it. But here I am, I got through it. I'm not in pain in my face anymore. Although it may hurt you, it doesn't hurt me. Are you with me? Not like that. 
for all of eternity, that pain will not go away. That agony, that torment will not go away. These are your friends. These are your family members. These are your co-workers. These are people that you sit next to uh, at different places, friends. These are people that wait on you down at the restaurant. Are you with me? These are people, real, true, honest people that are going to die and go to hell. What about this? I think if, and I don't know that this will ever happen, but if you could open up your eyes in hell and if you could come to terms with the fact that it's real and you're there and there's no escape and if you could ever calm your senses to look around and see who else is there, I think that that might just be a surprise of hell. Who else would be in hell alongside of you? There's going to be some people who aren't expected to be in hell that are going to make a personal appearance. Are you with me? I'm just going to go out there and I'm going to be ever so bold. There is a religious leader in the world today that proclaims to be Jesus Christ incarnate for His people. He is supposed to be the spiritual leader for that particular religion and He's going to make the rules and make all the final sayings and so on and so forth. And He's honored just like He was the Lord Jesus Christ Himself. But friends, if He dies without Christ, He is going to go to hell. He is the Pope of the Catholic Church and I want you to realize uh, in this world, everybody expects the Pope to make an appearance in heaven. But if he doesn't trust Jesus as his Savior, if he doesn't deny the teachings of the Catholic Church, I want you to realize that he is going to have to come to terms with the fact that hell is real and he is there. Can you imagine looking over Brother James if you opened up your eyes in hell and see the Pope right next to you? Huh? There's going to be grandmas and grandpas in hell. There's going to be moms and dads in hell. There's going to be brothers and sisters in hell. And can I just go ahead and throw something out to you? If you end up in hell, who are you going to be taking with you? What I really want you to think about is this. What about those little boys and girls that you brought into the world, your sons and daughters? If you don't care enough to get saved for yourself, you ought to do, care enough to do something so that they get saved. Listen, there's a lot of boys and girls out there in the world today raising families of their own. They were raised in church. They're saved as saved can be. But they're out of church. They're rejecting the things of God. And they are sending their children straight to hell because they will not take them to church. They will not teach them about Jesus. And boy, if you ever mention that to them, you're the worst person in the world because you ought not say that. You make me feel bad. Good. I want to make you feel bad. I want to make you feel like the lowest, worst father or mother on the planet earth uh, and because you're not taking care of your children's spiritual needs. And if you give them everything they need here on this earth and they're well taken care of for the next hundred years, well, hats off to you. You've done a good thing. But what about the millions of billions of zillions of whatever years that come after that? It's just a drop in the bucket that hundred years, isn't it? It, it, it's, it's amazing to me uh, how much Christians forget. I stand here guilty because there was a time in my life as saved as saved could be, I was in the world, living for the world. My wife was lost. My two oldest children were lost. And I was having the time of my life. I had new houses. I had new cars. I was going out on the weekends and partying. I was having a good time. If something had happened during that time and one of those folks had died, they would have stepped out into eternity unprepared and it would have been my fault. Blood on my hands, Brother Lamont. Think about this. You ever thought about who won't be in hell? Can I tell you this? There are some people who deserve to be in hell that if you were to go there, they would not be there. There will be some folks who actually murdered people that if you were to take a trip into hell, they would not be there. There are thieves that if you were to take a trip into hell, they'll not ever be there. Are you with me? There are people who did wicked, ungodly, heinous things in this world, but if you were to take a trip into hell, they would not be there. You say, Brother Steve, how in the world can this be? Why? We serve a loving God. 
We serve a long-suffering God who is willing that none should perish. N-O-N-E. None should perish, but that all should come into repentance. He wants you to get saved. He wants the worst person in the world to get saved. He wants the best person in the world to get saved. Hey, but can I tell you this? If the best person in the world dies without Jesus Christ, they'll open up their eyes in hell. And if the worst person ever known to man closes their eyes in a right relationship with Him, with the blood having been applied, they will open up their eyes in heaven. It's that simple. I've never spoke about this. But when I was pastoring the church down in Dry Ridge, I had a young woman whose sister was murdered by a man. And of course, you can imagine all the emotions that go along with that. But as I'm trying to win this woman to the Lord, for her to get saved, and I'm going through all of the doctrines of the Bible and teaching her everything that I know to convince her that she can be saved and that the Lord would forgive her of her sins, her mind switches over to her sister and that man. He, she says to me, now listen, this is the truth and this is the way it is whether you like it or you don't like it. She said, Brother Steve, if that man who murdered my sister gets saved, will he go to heaven? I said, yes, he will. And she couldn't stand it. But I said, you have to realize that if God's going to forgive one, He's going to forgive all. All means all. And she said, but Brother Steve, my sister died lost. So you're telling me, this is how people deduce things, you're telling me that the man who killed my sister and sent her out into eternity to go to hell could get saved and go to heaven. I said, yes ma'am, I'm telling you that. But here's what I want you to realize. Your sister had every opportunity to get saved by the grace of God. If I didn't believe it, Brother Lamont, I'd close the Bible, I'd go home and live however I wanted, but she had an opportunity to get saved and she rejected the blood of Jesus Christ. Or maybe she got saved and her sister didn't even know it. I don't know. But I do know this, that if that man who murdered that woman trusts Jesus Christ as his Savior, asks to be forgiven of his sins and gets washed in the blood, he will be redeemed and viewed sinless in the eyes of Almighty God. There's going to be some people who aren't in hell that would be surprising to people. Oh, you mentioned Charles Manson. If he ends up in hell, nobody would be surprised. But what if he ends up in heaven? He's still breathing air as far as I know. He's not dead. He's still alive in a prison out in California and did many ungodly things. But if he called on the name of Jesus Christ, he could be saved. What about this final surprise? In hell. I have more than that. I would say the devil isn't in charge. He's not. That'll surprise some people. I would say that there would be the realization that they didn't have to go there because they didn't. They'll remember the messages, they'll remember the opportunities. Anyone who's ever cast into the lake of fire will go in knowing that they go in justly, that they are worthy of that punishment. But you know what? They will in unison cry out at some point, I have been deceived. I have been deceived. Deceived by the devil. In Revelation chapter 20, verse number 10, it says, The devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone. He deceives many. We know that many are deceived by men who look righteous. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, it says, Evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. In other words, they're wrong, they're deceived, they're sending themselves to hell, but they're deceiving others and they're making, uh, uh, you know, disciples to their way of thinking and they're going to go to hell. But there's a whole lot of cults out there trying to get disciples. Some of them are doing a fairly good job of it, by the way. Had a man one time over at the work camp. 
He told me that he was going to be a member of the Muslim religion. He said, I'm going to do it because it's the black man's religion. And he was sitting in a room. I'd say 70% of the room was white and 30% of the room was black. There was enough black people there that made me uncomfortable for my safety in saying this. But I told him very clearly that that Muslim religion would send him and all other black men that believed in it to hell but that Jesus Christ saw no color. He did not see black, white, yellow, red, green, whatever. Huh? He is the Savior for the world. But there's a lot of men who deceive people. At some point in time, you're going to have to realize that you deceived yourself. In James chapter 1 and verse number 22, the Bible says, But be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. There's a lot of people that go through the motions. They come to church. They hear what the preacher preaches. They get as close to the actual truth as they possibly can. But they'll just be hearers of the Word. They won't be doers. They won't actually trust Jesus. They won't actually go all the way, but they'll just toy with it. They'll just play with it. They'll open up their eyes and He'll come to all these realizations and they'll realize that they have been deceived. Friends, it is easy for sinners to be deceived about sin. It comes natural for them to sin. Don't be surprised if you see a sinner sinning. But what is really surprising that a Christian could get so involved in their so-called life that they would be so involved with what's going on, whether it's good or bad, and they would get so wrapped up in themselves that they would forget that what we're doing here is a matter of life and death. I want plastic garbage cans in the bathroom and if I don't get them, I'm leaving. People are dying and going to hell. Are you with me? I mean, that's how absurd that it is. I appreciate your time this morning, but please understand you have got to keep in mind that people are dying and going to hell. And they're going to get some pretty big surprises. And the only way that they can get past that is if someone like you or me tells them about Jesus Christ. And if they see enough of Him living in us, that they want Him to be their Savior.